well, how would they know when to ask? So what are the things that we need to be watching for as parties, uh, as political folks, as MPs, as people who are running to be MPs, to have a better awareness and ask the correct questions so that hopefully we can get the information we need to do the things we need to do during an election process? I know that was a lot. Good luck, Ed. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I will probably pass to my service colleagues maybe to talk about foreign registry or a few of those points, but... Uh, just briefly, in terms of protection of, of MPs, um, and I, I, maybe I should just start by saying, you know, this is there's a constant learning process here for us as well. Uh, what we did in 2019, I think, worked reasonably well, and we tr t tried to take some lessons from that and and reuse or, or change. So there's a there is a need, I think, constantly to evaluate where we are. I would say, in comparing us to other nations, and specifically in the Five Eyes, um, we've gotten very uh, good comments and, and, and feedback from our Five Eyes partners and the way that we operate in this in this domain. And you, you're correct, there's probably some gaps there, undoubtedly, and I think we should look to highlight and close those where we can. Um, but in terms of protection for MPs, uh, certainly during the, the election, I know the, the Cyber Center, which is part of CSE, uh, had you know a 24-7 hotline that was available for MPs to reach out to. We provided specific guidance to, to MPs on how to protect uh, themselves with respect to their personal devices, information, really from a cybersecurity perspective. But I know there was other discussions in and around security for MPs from a, uh, a physical perspective uh, through probably RCMP. These were themes that came up, uh, and, and the service does uh, reach out as well and try to engage with those communities. So I don't know if the service wants to reply on, on that piece and maybe the registry bit. But. Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, through you. Um, so maybe I'll just uh, uh, put those in, in two buckets, sort of policy and... and, and uh, some of our, our briefings um, to folks that can be impacted by foreign influence activity. So just on, on the policy side, uh, foreign registry, of course, uh, you know, behind the scenes, certainly the service and, and our partners are engaged in uh, giving advice to government on, on uh, what we see as potentially useful tools that, that could uh, address uh, foreign influence activity. You know, something I would emphasize is that we're up against adversaries that are very sophisticated. They're using the full state apparatus in terms of their targeting against Canada. It's not a static uh, threat. It evolves. They watch very closely um, how we react and how we adapt, um, and they look for ways to work around that. So my, my point in saying that is there's no one silver bullet uh, to deal with this. And it needs to be a continuous process, a continuous conversation and, and engagement uh, uh, to address it. Um, in terms of um, sort of awareness uh, amongst Canadians and, and uh, political class as well, I mean, that is something the service, um, outside of the task, uh, the, the site task force, has been putting a lot of effort into in the last few years, uh, both in general terms. So engaging with parties in a classified setting, unclassified setting with, with broader audiences to educate them about the threat. Um, we have a number of unclassified publications on foreign influence activity that, that uh, give you a good idea of the flags to look for um, uh, in terms of foreign influence activity. But we also, I, I just want to say, you know, where we can, because a lot of what we're dealing with is highly classified intelligence. Where we can, we, we do try to engage um, individuals that we know are being targeted. And I say that outside of any specific case um, uh, or example. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Culkins, up to five minutes for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <laughs> question I have for you is, and whoever can, can answer this. Um, Australia's intelligence service recently intercepted a foreign interference plot and the situation had became so grave that Director General of Security Mike Burgess confirmed espionage and foreign interference on democracy with Australia or have now supplanted terrorism as a nation's principal uh, security concern. You're probably aware of that. Um, he also expressed that Beijing used dating, dating apps. 
to mine confidential information from thousands of, of Australians with access to classified information. That's not me. That's you. It would be the equivalent here in Canada. So in response to Australia's, um, Australia's new laws make it a crime to engage in covert, deceptive, or threatening conduct on behalf of a foreign government and so on. Um, and we're trying to figure out here as parliamentarians what we should be doing. But it's really difficult to figure out what we should be doing if we actually don't know what's going on. And I can, I can look up right now, I can, I can read Bloomberg, various very credible news articles coming out of Australia where they say that they've intercepted people who are bankrolling uh, money. We've had the same allegations here in Canada, yet nobody will say anything. Um, if they're willing to do it in Australia, if Beijing's willing to do it in Australia, I don't know why they wouldn't be willing to try it in Canada as well. Um, all I hear is media reports, but I can't seem to get a single um, official from the government of Canada to confirm or deny that there is actually money that's being bankrolled. So I can look at the documents that you provided. I look at the Cyber 30, Cybersecurity Threats Against Electoral Infrastructure, it's fully redacted. Cybersecurity Threats Against Political Parties and Government Officials, fully redacted. Foreign Interference in Political uh, foreign interference that's politically motivated, fully redacted. Um, overt influence, fully redacted. Overall threat assessment, fully redacted. Uh, I look at the other sides of the pages here. Foreign interference uh, for the public, fully redacted. I don't know what to communicate with my constituents. And it's, it's a really awkward position to be in because I actually, I don't want to impugn anybody's reputation here. And that's not what my intent is. I actually believe that, that our government officials are doing the best that they can. I believe you're very, very, very good at monitoring. I'm not so, so sure because I haven't seen any results that tell me that we're good at interdicting or stopping. I've got no media reports. I've got no information that tells me that we've actually stopped anything. But I do have a former colleague that tells me very clearly that Beijing was interfering in his election. And at last meeting, uh, the former ambassador to China said that just a threat to one riding alone undermines the integrity of our process. And I believe the bar that the government is now uh, saying is the overall election result has to be the bar in order for us to become public with information, not just undermining the integrity of one electoral district. So I'm just wondering if you can give me some clarification because I'm very, very frustrated right now um, with the lack of information, the lack of transparency, and the responsibility of trying to figure out how to solve this problem as a policymaker and as somebody who votes in legislation. So what is the bar? Should the bar be interfering in a single election, in a single riding, or should it be for the entirety of the country? Should there the presence of any money being um, discussed by a foreign actor then warrant public information? At what point does the public, because the public has to maintain confidence in our systems, in our institutions, and right now, i, I got to tell you, as a, somebody who represents the public, there is not a lot of public confidence in some of our public institutions right now. And I, wanna, I, I, I don't want to go down that road. I'm not trying to foment that feeling. I'm trying to protect our institutions. And I, I, I'm just frustrated. So can you, can you clarify for me? Because uh, the, going into an in-camera meeting doesn't seem to, to, to resolve any of the questions that I have. Um, are we or are we not? Has any election, has any candidate in this country been affected directly by foreign interference in the last two elections for any party. We hear about 11 in Toronto, we hear about Kenny Chu. Yes or no? Has, has, the, has the needle been moved in a single riding in, the, in either of the last two elections? Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll let, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Through you, I'll take a stab at that. There was a lot in that, that question. Um, so maybe just um, separating what occurs during an election and outside of an election, first of all, through the protocol and otherwise, you know, there are, there are uh, very, um, there's a policy in place and protocols in place during the election for very good reason because we want to be careful that we're not interfering with the democratic process. So, so there are thresholds that need to be met there. It's not determined by the site task force. It's determined by the panel of five in terms of when something is publicly communicated. Um, that's during an election period. Outside of an election period, 
uh, as I've said, we, we are communicating more. I, you know, I'll take the point, um, you can always do better, and, and I think certainly within the service, uh, we're looking for opportunities to be communicating with Canadians and, and politicians um, uh, in, in an unclassified setting. So um, certainly I, I, think, I think the effort is there. Um, and like I said, you had a lot in your question, and I've forgotten what the rest of it was. So I'm it was a rant, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I, well, and I, and I would say as well, so, you know, we can't, we can't speak to specific riding, specific candidates. We don't look at, you know, our measure is not whether foreign influence activity has, has moved the needle. When we see foreign influence activity, that's enough for us. Mm -hmm. That engages our mandate. That engages an investigation. That brings advice and assessments to government. Whether it changes the course of an election or, or in a writing um, is not something we measure. And it's, it's probably not something we, we could measure even if we wanted to, making that, that link between the two. But Thank certainly, you. Certainly when I we know. see when the see beep, beep, beep it, happens, it. I have to end it. But I do want to make sure we get the valid information. Exciting news. It is a public meeting. You can go back, watch the game tape, and send us more fruitful answers. We always welcome them. Um, Mr. Turnbull, up to five minutes for you. Thanks, Madam Chair. So, um, you know, I think uh, for me, I'm, I'm worried about the repercussions of the direction that, uh, unfortunately, the official opposition is, uh, is moving in, which I think probably has some real risks associated with it. So I'm wondering, uh, when you treat allegations in a published article in the Sam Cooper story I'm referring to that are really uncorroborated and, and unvalid.